Today we are talking about honor and mothers. And um, I guess just uh, right away, uh, you know, we could just stipulate two things uh, up front. It is the right thing to do to honor your mother. And secondly, it is the right thing for mothers to live honorable lives. Uh, yes, I made, a, I made a moral statement there, but it's true. It's true. Um, it is the right thing to do to honor our moms, and it is the right thing for, for mothers to live honorable lives. So as we talk about honor and mothers today, I know this is uh, geared uh, at the ladies, so guys, don't go, you know, surfing, uh, you know, on your phone or whatever, or seeing if the game has started yet, because uh, it hasn't, um, probably, unless it's in Europe. Uh, but there's something here for, for all of us, and I think sometimes when we aim messages, uh, you know, m- at mothers or at graduates or, or at fathers uh, or at baptismal candidates uh, or at uh, infants during infant baptism, whenever we have a, a message like that that kind of uh, is really geared to focus on a specific demographic, one of the dangers that we have is tuning out because we think there's nothing there for us, and that is tragic. So don't do that. Uh, while we are talking today to uh, the moms in the room, uh, grandmas, great-grandmas, as I said, uh, all those types of things, there, there are things here for, for all of us uh, to, uh, to, to glean from. So let's start today by just talking about that word honor. It is not a term uh, that is used much uh, in our culture, and when it is, uh, it is not used probably as it should be. But to honor means to attribute high status to somebody, to value them, to esteem them highly, to attribute high status, to value, to esteem highly. So let me ask you this. In terms of your mother, if she is still living today, your wife, is that how you feel? Because that's what it means to honor. What about your mother-in-law? Ooh, I just went to meddling now. And I will spend some time there today, so not going to apologize at all about that. Um, what about your mother-in-law? Jeanne, I love you. I promise. I've tried to be good. <laughs> How are we doing in, in terms of holding our mothers in high status, valuing them, esteeming them highly. Jesus talked about honor in Matthew 15, verse 4. He said, for God said, honor your father and mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. How many of you children today are glad you're living in the 21st century? And you're not some Israelite child in ancient, in the ancient Middle East, because in the eyes of God, with the with the Old Testament law, you were to be put to death. Think about that. Speaking evil of parents was on par with murder, with other forms, uh, with certain forms of sexual deviance, and those types of things. I will say this, in America, we do not, we do not think, uh, I mean, we just say, well, we're in the age of grace now. Did you know that grace takes the law further than the law ever went? Uh, And no, we're not going to start putting children to death. (laughs) That's how we're doing today. So before they all run out, that's not what this message is about. So, whoo! But it's just interesting to me, it's very intriguing that when we talk about honoring our parents, in the eyes of God, this is a massive deal. Later on, Jesus, talking to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, 19, said the same thing. He was uh, reiterating the Old Testament law. Honor your father and mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. Part of, part of doing that is honoring your father and your mother. Paul would later to the church in Ephesus say, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And notice there that in every one of these instances, 
uh, in, in the New Testament, when you see the word honor coming from the Old Testament law, honor your father and mother, in that phrase, every time it is something that is to be done all the time. Uh, so in terms of language arts, how many of you hated English? How many of you, because you hated English, that's why you speak Arabic today? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. English matters, and if you're going to properly interpret English, you know, you need, to, uh, you, you need to know how the language functions. And so we don't need to be experts in first century Greek, but we do need to understand that the, some of the nuances of the language. And when it comes to verbs in the New Testament, those verbs have three components that are really important. They have a voice, a tense, and a mood. All right? All the time that you see honor your father and mother, it is in the present tense, the active voice, and the imperative mood. Present tense means it never takes a break. You are always, with every beat of your heart and every breath that you take, this never takes a break. Present tense, it's always now honor, 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 honor your father and mother. The active voice means that it's something that you do. You perform the action. Somebody else doesn't do it for you, doesn't happen to you. You do the always action. You always honor active voice. And the imperative mood means it's a command. How many of your parents? <laughs> Get over here. How many of you had a coach that would do that? And you just took your time and thought about it for a minute and then sauntered over to the sideline when you were in school. How many of you did that? No. The imperative mood means it's a command. Well, every time you see honor your father and mother in the New Testament, when it's a direct quote from, from the Old Testament, that is the language, that's why God, God gave us the Greek language, because it's very specific. And it means that everywhere, all the time, by you, you are to honor your father and your mother. You say, my mom and my dad weren't honorable, which is why it's such a supernatural thing that you're doing that today in the power of the Holy Spirit. There are no excuses. In fact, notice there that little phrase here in verse 2 of Ephesians 6. For this is right. Paul is making a, he's making it a moral imperative. You are to, it is morally right, which means it is a sin when you don't. And I know we don't like to talk about sin a lot, but let's call it what it is. That's what Paul is saying. It is a sin when you don't honor your father and mother. We're out to a good start this morning, aren't we? This is good. Well, we're going to look at the life of Jesus uh, today. And in the life uh, of Jesus, there are very few instances that we have where we see him interacting with his folks. In fact, there are two that I think, uh, that there may be more than this. Uh, you know, certainly at the cross, I guess you could, you could call that number three, but we're just not given a lot of, that's more of a statement uh, from Jesus to Mary uh, there at the foot of the cross than it is an interaction. But there are two interactions that Jesus had with his parents, and in the one we're going to look at today in John chapter 2, uh, only one parent was there, and that was his mother, which means that Joseph had probably died. And in the first one, in Luke chapter 2, remember Jesus? He's 12 years old, and his parents leave, and they start traveling down the road, and they don't even realize that he's gone. Now, those of you who are older siblings, and Jesus was the oldest, you know that there are times when your parents forgot your siblings. They forgot them at practice. They forgot them. At, I got forgotten in the church. It was dark. It was dank. I mean, that happened more than once. I was asleep under the, you know, under the pew, you know. Well, there, I'm telling you, if this would have been my brother, first of all, he would have noticed I wasn't there. And when they said, hey, are you ready to go? He would have said, uh-huh. And then they'd have started galloping down, you know, on their wagon or whatever. Maybe it was a camel. I don't, how, does a, how does a camel go? Is it like this? I mean, I don't, I don't know. However that goes, my brother would have given his right leg for my parents to not turn around and go back and get me. Let's do the rest of life without Kenny. 
But they realize Jesus is gone, so they turn around and they go back and they get him. And at 12 years old, Jesus tells them, didn't you know I need to be about my father's business? Can I just give a challenge to every parent here? Let's stop selling our children short and thinking that they got to somehow grow up to become spiritual people. A 12-year-old boy, well, he was God. I know he was God. But Philippians tells us that he gave up all of his godness so that he could identify with us. A 12-year-old boy understood in his mind and in his heart that he was created by God to do God's purposes and, and, and do God's bidding with all of his life. And at 12 years old, he told his parents that. Did you notice in that encounter, by the way, in Luke 2, that they didn't really have a rebuttal? It was probably like, oh, uh, uh, come on, let's go. <laughs> Something like that. Like it is when we don't know what to say to our kids because they've outsmarted us again. I love that about Jesus. The second time that we see Jesus interacting with his parents is in John chapter 2. It is his first miracle that he performs. Joseph is not there by all indications, Joseph has probably passed away by the time that Jesus is roughly 30 years old here. Um, Jesus died when he was 33-ish, so if, and he spent three years in public ministry. This was the beginning of the public ministry. There's the, the rough math. So he's 30 years old, and his mom is here. Let's pick it up in verse 1 of John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. Incidentally, in the book of John, anytime you see Jesus referring to his hour, he's talking about the hour of his death, which would come, which would come later. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. How many of you have one of those hefty garbage deals out in your garage or whatever? It's about 30 gallons. Uh huh. You buy the 30-gallon bag. If you buy the smaller one, test your Christianity because you're trying to make it fit. <laughs> Anybody else ever been there? Uh-huh. Yeah. So there's six of those filled with water. <clears throat> They're stone water pots. About that size. Jesus says to them, verse 7, fill the water pots with water. And so they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some, some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, he, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. So we see here Jesus interacting in a, in a real small window with his mother. We learn a lot here about Jesus and the honor of his mother. And there's two things that we see here. Number one, how can we honor our mothers like Jesus honored his mother? And then secondly, moms, how can you be honorable? How can you live more honorable lives than you're currently living? So let's start by looking at honoring mothers. The first thing uh, that we need to do is respect your mom. Respect your mom. Again, Jesus here is an adult. He's probably 30 years old or so. And he speaks to his mother with respect. You say, no, he didn't. He called her woman. Ooh, slow down, Hoss. Slow down. This term is used one other time in the New Testament, in John chapter 19. I think it's verse 26. Jesus is on the cross. He's got nails through his feet into his hands. He's, he's hanging there naked. He's dying. And he looks down and he sees his mom weeping. And he says, woman, behold your son. You think Jesus said, woman, behold your son. In that statement, no. 
The point is, when we look at how this term was used, we know that it was not a term of disrespect. It was not a 21st century westernized American woman. That's not at all how I said it. This is a term of endearment. This is a a, a massive term of respect. Saying, woman, what does that have to do with us? He's not disrespecting his mother. He is respecting her. Now, we live in a culture of disrespect. I would venture to say the students, those of you who are here, if you were to ask those of us who are slightly older than you, uh, who have been through school and taken some of the classes you've taken, maybe even had some of the same teachers you had, some of us, if not all of us, grew up in an entirely different type of classroom atmosphere than you did, than you are. And here's what I mean by that. Disrespect is rampant in our school systems in many cases. And again, I'm not, I'm not dogging on, on teachers or administrators or anything. I'm, I'm just making statements and observations here. There is so much disrespect. There's back talk that comes from students to, to, to teachers as though they're just, you know, they're, they're just worthless pieces of trash. Let me tell you something. I, my fourth, fifth, and sixth grade teacher was a, a high school football coach. There's Mr. Kalanick. I told the story before. He took Guy Short in the fifth grade, and he grabbed him right here, and he put him in the corner, and he hoisted him up, and he said, you will never address me like that again. You will not. He didn't leave any marks, but he got him up off the ground, and there was, there was nobody breathing in the room at that moment, so a guy came back down. By the way, a guy's mom is the one who hit me with the Camaro Z28 in 1982, broke my tibia, fibia, big toe, and foot, so uh, there's no animosity here at all, but... What I am saying is that from that time on, Guy Short respected Mr. Kalanick. When I was in the third grade, Mrs. Vance was my teacher. And I've told the story before how she called my dad, tattletale. Why? Because I sassed her. I disrespected her, and that night, my dad, not my mom, my dad washed my mouth out with soap. It was always worse to get disciplined by dad. Always. Always. And dad washed my mouth out with soap for how I had disrespected my teacher. That same teacher, she washed three of my classmates' mouths out with soap in class. At the back of the room, not in the bathroom, in the back of the room. Travis, Todd, and Chuck. Why? Because they sassed her and they cussed. And her point was, there will not be that kind of disrespect here. And you know what she was doing? You know why there were no parents that were rushing in to save their precious little children? Oh, this is abuse. We're going to sue the school system. You know why that didn't happen? Because our teachers actually cared deeply about us as students. And the teachers knew they were reinforcing what was happening in the home. And the parents loved it. You see, back then, the home and the school system and the government were relatively on the same page. Now we're in a fragmented society where that's no longer true. And so the reason that we have that kind of stuff happening in classrooms is because that disrespect is allowed in the homes. It's also why we have employers. Talk to the employers in the room. Employers have a harder time with employees today because of a lack of respect. There's not just any respect given, no matter how respectful of a person you are. The disrespect is almost, it's almost anticipated that there's going to be disrespect toward coworkers. There's going to be disrespect uh, toward toward the the, the managers and towards towards the business owners and all of this. Why? It's because we've lost our foothold on the, the concept of honor. And honor doesn't start at work. Honor doesn't start in the school system. Honoring your mom and dad starts at home. And God says, honor your mom and dad every day, everywhere, all the time. And if you don't, get spanked. <laughs> At least that's, how, that's the translation my parents used. You know, I mean, I mean, so, so respect your mom. And I, I want to ask you today, are you respecting your mom? Are you, are you respecting her? Secondly, notice this. We are to help our moms. Help your mom. Help your mom. This is what Jesus did, verses 6 through 9. Jesus says, fill the water pots. 
And then he says, draw some water out now. And so they took it from him. And the head waiter talks about uh, the wine, and he calls the, br- the, 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 uh, the, the bridegroom over, and he says, why have you saved the wine? What was Jesus doing? What was Jesus doing as he interacted with Mary before all of this? What was he doing when he said, when he said woman, my time has not yet come? He was helping his mom see God's perspective on the situation. It was God's will that Jesus, at this event, enter into his public ministry. Jesus' primary concern was not saying yes to his mother's request to help this family out so they don't get embarrassed by running out of wine and cut the celebration short. That wasn't his highest concern. He took this moment to help his mom understand God's perspective on things. This, my hour has not yet come, but you know what? The Father wants to do this now. What a great opportunity we have to listen to our kids. This last week, I, I shared it with the board too. We had two, uh, two little kids over. I shouldn't say we. Uh, Brenda and Noel had two little kids over. And I stopped in occasionally. <laughs> I stopped in occasionally uh, to, you know, to see how things were going. Because, uh, you know, kids, kids are cute when they're cute. But when they're that small, sometimes they can be ugly. And so it's always nice that they watch kids <laughs> during work so that I can go back to, you know, go back to work. Or, or whatever, but uh, there was this, there, there's this little kid, uh, and there, there's this, this, this toy that we had, and it was missing a little pla- plastic hook. It was, a, it was a Tonka truck, and he was just obsessed with the fact that this hook was missing, and he, he even asked, you know, he's three years old, can we go down to Ace Hardware and get one? I'm <laughs> like, dude, how old are you? Just, so it's awesome, but, and so, it's just, so, so a few more hours pass, uh, and and I, I I get my wheels thinking while I'm you know back at work and doing doing some other stuff and so next time I'm home I grab a little twisty uh, out of the the drawer and I take this twisty and I finger it through and I start to forge this this hook for this little kid on this and Brenda says hey come come and look what what Ken's doing and he comes over I mean the biggest grin I can't even do it because he I mean it's just this huge grin and he, ah, 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 and he I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is a twisty. <laughs> this is going to bend and not even work. But God in that moment, that child, through that interaction, he was, as he spoke to me, it was like the voice of God coming through that kid saying, this is what I want from you. Get your polluted maturity out of the way. And bring your childlike faith before me. And just look at the wonder that you will find. And you see, kids can help us, moms. Our kids can help us see what God is doing. So help your mom. Now, I mean, here's the thing about helping, helping your mom. In yielding to God like Jesus did, you will always help other people. You'll always help other people when you yield to God. When you obey God, you will always help other people. Jesus' primary concern was not helping his mom, but because he obeyed God, his mom got blessed. Go figure. That's how it works. Get your, you know, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And that's how it works. In yielding to God, we will always help others. And so let me just say to you, those of you who still live uh, in a home with your, with your parents, stop disrespecting them and start helping them. Do the dishes. They are meddling now. Yeah. Vacuum the floor. Take the laundry to the laundry room. You know, I mean, do something. Provide perspective on on some issues. Go split the wood. Go stack the wood. Do something. Why? Just to be helpful. Because you know what that is? That's honoring to your parents. That's honoring to your mother. If your mom is, uh, is, is older and you're out of the house and those kinds of things, honor her. Honor her. You know, when I walk into my mom's house... I don't do whatever I want. You know why? It's not my house. And last time your parents checked, your name wasn't on the mortgage or the deed. So help your mom and do something without grumbling. Do something without complaining. That's what Jesus did. He helped her see God's perspective, and then he actually helped her with the request. 
that she had come to him with. Number three, spend time with your mom. Love verse 12. After, he went, after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. What did they do? Well, we're not told, but you know what? It's Jesus, so they probably had fun. Oh, yeah, they probably had fun. Aww. I mean, come on. Do you really think that they stayed there a few days bored out of their gourd? No. This is Jesus. He just turned how many stories? Six times, like 180 gallons of water into wine. Are you kidding? Think about that. That's bizarre. And they went there for a few days, and that's all John tells us. He's like, I'm not going to write anymore about that. I'm not going to tell him anymore. But they spent time, and he, he went with his mom. You know, sometimes just stop by. Just stop by and say hi to your mom. Give her a call. Nowadays, it's easier to spend time than it probably ever has been, you know, with uh, you know, FaceTime and all that kind of stuff. You can actually see what your mom's doing or if they know how to run FaceTime. So sometimes you'll get people who try FaceTime and you can see half their face, <laughs> you know, or, or, or they'll have it in their lap. That's how I was when I first started using it. I'm like, what, it just doesn't work? Oh, I got to hold it up here right in front of me. Okay, now you can see me, right? But it's easier now to spend, to spend I mean, hey, if you can't be with them, at least go to that next level of connection. Do the next best thing, but spend time. With your mom, stop, you know, stop by, have a cup of coffee, do whatever. But spend some time because that, it matters. Spending time with your parents is a good thing. And let me just, uh, let me just continue to speak from the heart here. Hey, I know now, obviously, like many of you, more than I have ever known before, that our parents are not always going to be with us. I had a fantastic relationship with my dad, and I got a great relationship with my mom. But you know what? I don't really have any regrets about my dad's passing. But if, if I were to, to throw one out there, it would just simply have to do with spending time together. Not that I wanted him living in my basement. Ooh. You know, <laughs> but I wish that I would have in that year said, hey, you want to go hunting for a few days? You know, maybe I would have taken the f extra 15 minutes when I was in Great Falls. But you know what? We kind of get into this thing like, you know, ah, parents, you know, and yeah, I know, leave and cleave and all that, but don't be afraid to go the extra mile and spend some time with your folks. If you're better at a board game than them, stop by and play that game. <laughs> because you can leave while they fume. It's, it's a great idea. <laughs> it's, it's a great, that's a terrible idea. Find one they like. Find one that they like. So, Jesus teaches us all of these things. Respect your mom. Help your mom. Spend time with your mom. But we learn also some things that are applicable for, from Mary about being honorable mothers. And let's just look at a couple of those things uh, real briefly this morning. First of all, recognize when you're no longer in charge. Recognize when you're no longer in charge. Now, this starts when kids are little, you know, and you start giving them more responsibility, and they can ride their bicycle without their training wheels, and then they can ride their bicycle but not cross that street. We couldn't cross the railroad tracks, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, and if we did, we got in trouble and all that because the train might come through. It came through once a day and then once in the middle of the night. So, all right, all right, we know the schedule, but we won't go on the tracks. I know. Um, I wonder if my brother ever tried to tie me to the tracks. Like Dudley do right. Remember him always trying to save the gal that got tied to the tracks? I'm glad he didn't watch that cartoon because he may have tried that. <laughs> but anyway, recognize when you're no longer in charge. As our kids get older, they get their driver's license, and now what? Now, now they don't need me to go somewhere. Ooh, that's scary. And what are we doing? We're, we're giving more responsibility. We're giving more trust. And that's what we see in Mary here. She recognized when Jesus said, what does this have? My hour has not yet come. She said, do what he says. What is that? That's a recognition that she was, she was not in charge. And it was a gentle reminder from Jesus that she was no longer in charge. I was talking to somebody after the first service today about this. They were talking about how difficult this is. Somebody who's got grown kids and that, that kind of thing. It's just very difficult to let go. And then there's times when you do have to step in, you know, and, and grab things and, you know, pull them back. But you don't stay there. 
you know, once you, once you help them, you know, get things kind of welded together, you, you back up again uh, and, and recognize you're not in charge. And we see that with Mary, and this is an honorable thing. Jesus set the example here by, by helping Mary to see what God was doing. And in the same way, Mary had to recognize what God was doing and recognize that it was not, that Jesus was not her child. You know, as parents, could there be, I mean, is there a harder thing for us to, to deal with some days, especially when our kids are, are small? God never gave our kids to us to belong to us first. Our children are God's, and they've been placed in our charge and in our care. Oof. They are His. What a responsibility. What a responsibility. And as we recognize that, we recognize, man, my life, my life belongs to God. The life of my child, the life of my children, it's not mine to control. So recognize when you're no longer in charge. And then secondly, counsel your kids to obey God. Counsel your kids to obey God. What did Mary say? <laughs> Whatever he says, do it. <laughs> I love that. Oh, it's just fantastic. You know, if your child ever comes to you, uh, you know, Mom, I, 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 I just, I got this thing going on at work, or I got this thing going on in the marriage, or I got this thing going on with the kids. Or I got, here, here's, here's a great response. Have you talked to your Heavenly Father yet? And when they say no, because more than 90% of the time they'll say no, okay, then say, well, come back after you've done that. What are you doing? You're counseling them to obey God. Go to God first. Don't come to me first. Fill your spirit with God first, and then as I do the same thing, we can come together, and now let's talk about this. You see, what, what incredible counsel that would be to our kids. What, what if our kids, what if we counseled them to obey God so that as adults, that was just, it, we just expected that they would have already talked to God before they ever came to us. How cool would that be? Counsel your kids to obey God. Tell me where you're going to go wrong if you counsel your kids to do what God says. Counsel your kids to always obey God. When every other student is trying to cheat, when every other student is telling your, your child, hey, don't break the curve, <laughs> help your student break the curve so that them other suckers flunk. <laughs> Listen, God didn't create high schoolers to give half an effort. You challenge them to get in there and do their best for God. Counsel your kids to obey God. And in this way, we find this is honorable behavior, if you will, for moms to follow. And so moms need to be honored. And we can all do a better job at honoring our moms. We all can. Nobody, nobody's perfect. Well, Jesus was. And we're glad we weren't in his family. <laughs> Can you imagine me and his siblings? <laughs> Why can't you just be like your eldest brother? Because I'm not God. No. I doubt Mary ever did that, though it would have been funny. Because I wasn't in the family. But we can all do a better job honoring our moms. And you know what? We need to. There's some moms that are probably seated here today who don't get a lot of honor and respect and help from their kids. And so from their church family, they need to receive that honor. They need to receive that respect, that help. That's what they need. And we need, we, need to, we need to cowboy up and do that. Let's be like Jesus and honor our moms. Moms, you can build honorable responses into your own life. Honoring parents is a key to the spiritual life. It's not meant to be a holiday that we do one time a year. Some of you were bummed because today's Mother's Day and you got to go out to eat and mom always picks up the tab. But it's Mother's Day, so I, I mean, God, stop being so cheap. Grab the tab. Well, she never lets me. Alligator arms, you know what I mean? <laughs> Tell the waiter when you come in, I'll take the ticket. Let her buy, let him, let your dad buy whatever occasionally, sure. 
But be honoring. Don't just make it a holiday. This, this holiday reminds us of, of the way life should be, that mothers should be honored. And so let me ask you, does honor need to be built into your home? Are there some things you need to change with your, with your family and the dynamics that are there? And don't ignore God. Begin to change today those dynamics in the home so that honor can take its proper place. What about in the workplace? What about in your family or your extended family? What about with your grandma? What about with your mother-in-law? Are you honoring your mother-in-law as much as you are honoring your mother? Well, the Bible doesn't say I have to. Okay, you can take that little gravel road if you want. Problem is, when it rains, it gets muddy and nasty, and you're going to find yourself a long way from home in a whole lot of trouble. Of course, you're supposed to honor your mother-in-law. God devoted one out of 66 books in his anthology that we call the Bible to the relationship between a mother and a mother-in-law. Ruth, honor your mother-in-law. Forgive her. Well, I'll forgive her when she comes. Stop it. Honor. And some of, some of you need to hear that. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's just the truth. And that's okay. It's okay maybe that that, I shouldn't say it's okay, but it's good that you're hearing that today because God cares about that relationship. And especially if she's a Christian, and I can already hear it in your minds. Well, she says she is. <laughs> but I know where she's going. Man, we need some heart surgery, don't we? That's terrible. That's terrible. We've got to get along here. Because in eternity, we're going to be together. Start the honor now. Start the honor now. Will you stand with me this morning? Jesus, we're so thankful for every mom that is here, every grandma, every great-grandma. Lord, for those who have passed away and gone on before us, we're thankful for their influence in our life. Lord, today, if there is any sin of that is connected with dishonoring our folks, uh, Lord, and, and particularly our moms, Lord, disrespect, uh, just laziness, not helping, uh, ignoring, not spending time with them, those kinds of things. God, I pray that you'd forgive us, and I just pray that today you would help us to make whatever course corrections we need to make. Help us to see our moms, our mothers-in-law, and, and our, our grandmas and, and, and our daughters. Help us to see them through your eyes, beautiful, created, and fashioned in your image. And Lord, may we go to the, the nth degree to honor them in a culture that desperately needs to be reacquainted with honoring of parents. And so, Jesus, we give you thanks for these lives that have impacted us. We ask your forgiveness for how maybe we've taken them for granted. And, Lord, I pray your blessing upon every mom, upon every grandma, every great-grandma. If there's great-great-grandmas, every young woman who <clears throat> ever hopes to be a mom, I pray your blessing upon them today. May there be an awareness of your presence that they haven't known for weeks, months, maybe even years. And God, I pray that they would sense your honor of them in their hearts today. We give you all the thanks and the praise for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Moms, be sure to grab some flowers on your way out today.